Hi, everybody, and welcome to Solitude's very first technology and innovation series webinar um, regarding erosion. We have a, quite a large audience with us today. We had over 700 people register. We're pretty excited about that. Um, we even had folks register down in Puerto Rico. So all different um, areas of the country and Puerto Rico and from all different backgrounds, we've got some golf superintendents that have registered, some community managers, some HOA presidents. So we are really excited that you all have decided to join us. And we have a lot of information here for you guys on this webinar. Um, and we, I wanted to go over just a couple little features here to ensure that you have the best experience that you can with this webinar. Um, the first feature is going to be our questions feature. So anytime you have a question um, throughout the presentation, you can ask that through the chat feature, which is under the questions tab. Um, the second feature that we'd like for you guys to utilize and participate in is going to be a poll questionnaire. Um, we do have one of those that's going to be in the middle of the webinar. Um, and then I also want to mention that the webinar is going to be recorded. So if you'd like to watch this at a later time or show this to somebody that was unable to view this um, as it is live, we are going to provide a link and a follow-up email um, that will give you the link to the webinar. And also you're going to be able to um, view this through the Solitude website at a later date. Um, and then let me also mention that we are going to have a feedback survey when the webinar is over um, and you can ask more questions in there. Um, you can also request a consultation. Um, and one lucky listener participant in the webinar is going to um, receive a $50 Amazon gift card and a Solitude cooler. Um, my name is Marty Beach. I'm your host today. I am a business development consultant for Solitude Lake Management. I am located out of Orlando, Florida. Um, I came on to Solitude last year to help grow the region, and um, I love talking to folks about sustainable lake and wetland practices, um, fisheries, fish stocking, and of course, erosion. Um, so next I'm going to introduce Bo Burns, and Bo is Solitude's market development manager. He has over 30 years of experience. Um, Bo has a diverse background in all aspects of lake and pond management. He is a highly connected leader within in the industry, and he's been a key player in researching and developing new technologies to bring to market. Um, Bo has earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Hiram College in Ohio, and he has a master's of environmental management degree in resource and wetland ecology from Duke University. Bo is our expert in all things erosion, and he has presented many solutions to different clients all over the country. So let's welcome Bo. And next, I want to introduce Ryan Leeds, and he is our guest from Sox Erosion Solutions. And Ryan is a pioneer in the erosion control industry, and he has more than 20 years of experience. He's a leading innovator and an expert focused on the development of Sox Erosion Control technology, um, which, as you'll find out in the webinar, it's an eco-friendly solution for shoreline and hillside restoration. Um, Ryan really likes educating municipal leaders, property owners, property managers, and golf superintendents about the benefits of living shorelines and continues to work towards the development of shoreline and hillside erosion control systems. Again, we want to thank you all for being here. Um, we really appreciate your participation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is our very first um, webinar in our um, innovation and technology series. We are always um, pursuing the newest and um, advancements in lake management, and we're excited to share these with you today. So let's go ahead and get started with the webinar. Um, a quick run through the agenda. Um, we're gonna speak about uh, first going into the shoreline erosion problems. Then we'll talk about why we should fix the problem. Um, we'll discuss the ecological benefits of why you should fix your shoreline erosion problem. Um, and then we are going to discuss some of the solutions um, for erosion. Uh, then we're going to go into why you should care about this. And then finally, we're going to end the webinar out with a question and answer. Um, so don't forget that you can answer question, uh, ask questions anytime during the webinar with our chat feature. Um, so let's jump right in and talk about what is erosion and why does that happen? Um, well, erosion, it's a... Common and natural phenomena, basically it's 
material from one area, usually the top, um, moving down to the bottom. So it's just materials getting transported from one location to another. Um, and it can occur for a number of reasons, as you see listed here, in harsh weather, obviously, you know, a heavy rain or hurricanes can cause this erosion. Um, recreation, boats and jet skis on waterways can create wakes and those wakes eventually break down the shoreline. Um, animals, down here in Florida, we have a problem with, um, you know, crabs, land crabs, certain types of fish burrow into the sides of your banks. Um, poor landscape design can also weigh into um, why you have Shoreline erosion, um, if it was never graded correctly in the first place, that can, you know, make your erosion happen quicker. Um, and then also an aging freshwater ecosystem. Um, the process just wears down the water body's edge and this causes terrible management issues. So fixing your erosion problem um, and why is this important to the health of your lake, your stormwater pond, or your canal? Um, if you ignore this issue, it can have some really damaging results. Um, you know, one of them being vegetation and habitat loss. Um, this also leads to nutrient loading. Um, your vegetation helps pull those nutrients out of the water going in. Um, you know, that could cause damage to your stormwater structures, your inflow and outflow structures can be damaged. You can see there in the top middle slide. Um, excess runoff is another issue that you deal with with erosion. Um, loss of assets, a big one. Um, you know, you, as time goes by, you're going to lose basically your property. Um, and where, as I've seen some folks that, you know, 15 years ago, they had 30 feet of shoreline and now they're down to half of that, so 15 feet. So in essence, that does affect the property values. Um, loss of aesthetics, it's just plain ugly, as you can see from these pictures. Um, the intended landscape design is also um, an issue. And lastly, and probably most importantly, it's a hazard. This can be really dangerous. Um, and the, you know, this erosion can also form trenches and gullies and hazardous banks. You can see the bottom right hand um, picture how severe that that hazardous bank has become. Um, all of these will accelerate the rate of your water body losing depth and volume as this material flows into your water body. Um, and it also increases, you know, the end of the lifespan of your water body. Um, so with all of this in mind, um, let's talk about why having a stable shoreline is beneficial to your water body. Um, but first, let's move into the poll. Um, so in the poll, we are asking, which of the following erosion problems are you facing? And please be sure to pick all that apply. Um, and the answers we have are um, poor aesthetics, less playing area for golfers, nutrient loading, hazard to the public, damage to stormwater, um, functionality, and infrastructure. So I'll give you a few seconds here to go ahead and, and do the poll. So, wow, it looks like um, everybody is dealing with a little bit of everything here, um, which is totally understandable, and it's pretty pretty even across the board. Um, thank you all for participating in that. So let's move into um, looking at the ecological benefits to a healthy shoreline. So the ecological benefits of controlling erosion, um, very first and foremost is a stable shoreline. I mean, it saves your water body from destructive results, which can lead to costly repairs. Um, your shoreline can also improve and maintain your healthy water quality. Um, it creates a strong vegetative habit. Um, a solid shoreline filters out the excess nutrients that we talked about later and excess nutrients that go into your water body can cause algal blooms. Um, it can feed the, the weeds that are there. Um, so that's a really important, um, that's a really important factor to consider. And lastly, you get a stable, stable substrate um, that will support your root system. And that even allows for a stronger and more stable shoreline or hillside. 
Um, now that you know these benefits, let's talk about why it's important to care about erosion. So why you should care, as I mentioned earlier, hazard. Um, I'm just gonna tell you a quick story. I was out on a site on Tuesday looking at an erosion issue and an elderly gentleman from the house next door came over, his knee was wrapped and he had said the week before he had fallen into the, the lake because of um, an erosion issue. So hazard is, is the number one issue that we should be concerned about. Um, you know, we talked about golfers in the pole, uh, you know, golfers, can go in the water. Um, children playing near pond water, they can go in the pond. Um, and lawn maintenance, and these guys are on heavy equipment driving around their lawn mowers and they get too close to an eroded shoreline and they're going in. Um, so it's pretty important to fix your unstable shoreline. Um, and you'll also remember from the beginning of the, the webinar that we talked about property value and the huge impact that it has um, on erosion um, you know, you're, you can see from this first slide on the left that this is getting dangerously close to these people's homes. So, um, you know, you're, you're actually losing land. Um, and then also poor aesthetics, like we mentioned, it's just very unsightly. Um, it can disappoint not only you, but your neighbors, if this is in a golf community, the golfers. Um, and again, it's going back to affecting your property value. Um, and then we're talking about stormwater regulations. Um, erosion can affect your stormwater regulations and functionality of your stormwater pond. Um, and then also you were talking about end of water body lifespan. Um, all lakes and ponds and stormwater uh, ponds, they do age over time and they do have a lifespan, but maintaining um, the erosion issues and having a stable shore bank can definitely slow down um, the effects of your water body's aging. Um, now that we've talked about the risks of erosion, let's go ahead and look at a couple of management solutions. So there are three management solutions that we're gonna talk about today in the webinar. Um, and the first one's going to be SOX erosion solutions. Then we're gonna talk about the coconut fiber log solution and then vegetative plantings. And we always recommend that no matter what solution you choose that you try to incorporate vegetative planting um, not only does it look pretty, but it also helps to um, remove some of those nutrients that are going in to the water. Um, so I am going to pass this on to Bo, and he's going to talk to you about these solutions. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, if I'm not the first, uh, I'd like to at least wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. Today is Valentine's Day, and um, I was looking for a red shirt to wear today, but uh, I don't own any, so I'm um, I'm wearing my Duke blue shirt with Solitude on it. So uh, that's that's my uh, my shirt for today. Um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable when I get listed as an expert for erosion control. Um, I guess just because I've spent 35 years now in in lake and pond management, um, I, I feel like I'm one of these type of people that I know a lot. A little bit about a lot of things when it comes to lake and ponds. Um, I don't know if I know uh, a, a whole lot about any of them in particular. So my job responsibility is to try to find um, ways to uh, uh, bring new solutions to us. Uh, here at Solitude, we, we're trying to be on the forefront of bringing new technologies and new services that are help uh, helping our customers. Um, with that being said, uh, when I first started with the company, I was talking to all of our operations people all throughout the country. And overwhelmingly, the biggest response I got was we need a we need a solution for erosion control and, and dredging. Those were the two big issues that people keep telling me that they need help with. Um, with that being said, um, I guess um, uh, the expertise that I have is knowing a lot of people and knowing who to go to. And uh, I was very, very fortunate to um, come across and and, uh, and find the people from SOX and um, SOX Solutions. And, and Brian Fisher, Ryan Leeds, and Jake Shea have been an asset for me. Um, I've been lucky to surround myself with good people that help, help to make me the expert as well. Um, one thing I do want to say is Solitude is really uh, adamant about trying to provide you with really good educational information. 
Um, so don't uh, mistake some of the excitement that we have about some of these new products and, and new uh, techniques to uh, give you a better solution a as a sales talk. It's really to educate you on these things, um, but it's pretty exciting. We, we've uh, There's been a lot of development over the last few years, and um, it, it, it's a, a new feature that we'd like to share with you. Uh, looking at the dread sock, there's really there's three there's three different types of dread socks or socks, not dread socks, socks. Uh, you have a shore sock, a dread sock, and a socks fence. Um, all three of these are have in common is that all of them have a three knitted polyethylene soft armor co cover on the outside, and then there's a liner that's lined with uh, burlap. Um, the material and the construction of this uh, makes it very, very well suited for allowing water to pass through, yet it holds back organic and it holds back spi even fine silt material. So it, it's an excellent material to help prevent uh, further erosion or erosion to start in the first place. Um, and it does allow water to move through it. There is a slight difference between the dread socks uh, and the sock fence uh, compared to the shore sock, and that is that the, the dread sock and the sock fence, both of those have a double knitted polyethylene uh, outer shell to it. And that's simply because of the situations they're used in, um, it, those materials are a little bit stronger and they actually have the ability to, to uh, filter out even more fine sediment and provide the water to be able to pass through them as well. One of the other differences between them is that the shore sock actually uses uh, material from uh, locally sourced material. It can be so, uh, fill dirt, it could be composted material, it could be mulch. Uh, I think the most, the best, some of the best results we've seen are when people using a combination of that, uh, they'll use a combination of uh, uh, fill dirt as well as composted and mulch. The dread sock, on the other hand, is really interesting, and, and there's a, a lot more interest with this because you can actually accomplish several tasks with one, one operation here. The dread sock uh, actually takes material from the pond or water body itself uh, with a suction harvest uh, dredge, and it pumps it up, and then it is pumped right back into the uh, dread sock's material. So you basically reclaiming back not only your shoreline, but you're reclaiming back some of your depth from all that eroded material that has gone down into the water body over the years. You're able to take that same material and push it back up, pump it back up. That middle picture there shows you that blue tube, which is pumping the material from the pond right back into the sock. On the other hand, you look at this, the sock fence and what makes this different than a traditional silt fence. Um, and it is truly a better silt fence than what's ever been on the market uh, before. Uh, it's a much stronger woven material. Again, the same knitted material as, as what we talked about with the before. All three of them have that polyethylene knitted material. Um, it, it keeps it from uh, shredding or tearing. If, if it does get a tear in it, it's not going to expand and it's not going to tether any longer. Um, it, it has uh, the ability to be anchored uh, with a uh, anchoring system without digging. Um, all three of these types of systems do not require a lot of big heavy equipment. So it's, it's, a, it's something that doesn't leave a heavy footprint um, while it's being uh, implemented. And um, the other really nice thing about this material is that it, it, it's really suited uh, for planting um, vegetation back around it or in, into it as well. Um, and also, the, the, you, you look at the, uh, the shore sock or the sock fence, uh, the, these materials can actually be used uh, in places outside of just our water bodies. Um, obviously, they're, they're really well suited for, for shorelines, uh, on coastal areas, uh, sh uh, and, and freshwater bodies, uh, brackish water. Um, but they also can be used uh, on hillsides. Uh, in, out in California, for example, they had the wildfires come through. Uh, those wildfires uh, caused a lot of the devastation to all that vegetation. When you remove the vegetation, they're susceptible now to the rains and and a lot of mudslides and, 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 and organic matter being moved around. 
And um, so these materials can be used to stabilize shores, not only the shores, but also uh, banks, hillsides, um, and, and, and they've, they've been proven. Um, some of these projects where these materials have been uh, installed are going on 20 years and they still have integrity, they're still holding up, and they still look really, really good. So with the next slide, what I'm going to do is try to give you a, a brief diagram of how, how these uh, shore sock and the dread sock basically are, are installed. It's a simplified diagram, but if you look at step one, um, you can see actually where you have an anchoring system, which this is a patented anchoring system that separates this from a lot of other material uh, uh, on the market. And, and basically those are anchored up under the hard stable shore. And then uh, they have lead ropes that go down uh, through that material. Um, once that's in place, you basically in step two, you can take and fill that material now. And then on step three, it shows it is pulled back up and tethered back to the same stake. So it, it's tethered very tightly and you don't get bulges with it. And it's really flexible to contour around shorelines. Uh, you don't have to have a straight shoreline. It's really easy to take this type of material, even to go around planted trees that are maybe on the shoreline. Um, so you can work right around those areas. Um, I like to look at, at, at diagram three and kind of envision it looking like a taco and you slide that taco right into the shore. And then you put your fill material in that taco and then you secure it up at the top. So it's kind of interesting to how it has that look to it. It, it, you, you can pull it tight and, and it's anchored to the same system on, on the hard shore up, up above. Um, step four, it, it shows the uh, concept of taking this material and then you can sod right over top of that material. So it's not unsightly. Immediately in days of uh, installation, um, they can put the sod on top of this thing immediately when they're done. And so you don't have to go for a long period of time of trying to wait for vegetation to establish. You can establish vegetation right on top of it. That woven uh, polyethylene material is really suited for the roots to be able to adhere into it. And so it really makes a nice stable place for the, for the uh, vegetation to grow, whether it's sod. Or you can actually take and um, you can cut into this material. It, like I said, it's a kind of a knitted material. And if, if you can envision, uh, if y'all have heard about ripstop material, where if you get a snag or rip in something, it, the way that it's knitted, it prevents it from ripping any further. Well, this is really a benefit of this material. You can actually cut into it and take your planter pots of emergent vegetation, for example, and you can plant right down into it. The material is really good for not expanding. Those cuts don't get any bigger than the cut that you make. and um, the material also provides a, a good way for moisture to be around those roots. It kind of the burlap inside when it gets wet, it holds moisture for a longer period of time for the, for the uh, root systems to develop. So, you know, at, at, at this time, um, I'm going to turn this over to, um, to Ryan, who is really an expert in this. Ryan leads. Uh, Ryan's become a good friend as well. And uh, he's been really, really good at providing a lot of expertise for all of us at Solitude. So at this time, we'll pass it over to Ryan. Well, Bo, thank you very much. And uh, and as as Bo had uh, mentioned earlier in the uh, in in his statements, uh, Happy Valentine's Day. I also am not wearing red or pink because, like Bo, I don't own red or pink clothing. But I do own green because that's obviously the color that we we are uh, uh, planning to expand in our environment. <clears throat> the Sox Erosion Solutions, as Bo had mentioned, and Bo, by the way, you did a great job, and I appreciate the passion that you have for this product and the passion. Forget about the product, the passion for stabilizing shorelines and 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 just focusing on on the needs of the environment. In the in the uh, in the picture that you see below, this is a very very common. Uh, theme, no matter where you are in the world, right? Because golf is a massive uh, use of property. And whenever we have golf courses or HOAs or PUDs, we get into situations where you have massive deforestation and, and large areas of natural trees and natural environments having been deforested and, and 
and the, the, the stable uh, infrastructure gets removed from that environment. So from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, we've done projects and we've seen projects from Florida to California to Texas to Michigan to Indiana, you know, all over the country, there are common themes in different types of properties. Uh, in golf courses, obviously this is a golf course picture that you're seeing, we have an area where the, the, uh, the property has been deforested and, and all of that, uh, that stability has been removed and you have sloughing shorelines. Sometimes the shorelines that slough down into the water body are, uh, you know, are, are even with the water body all the way up to, you know, significant walls and, and elevations. In this case, obviously, we have a very gentle slope. One of the advantages of our system is, is you know, as compared to some others, is, is that we can create through planning and through simple planning and working with the property owners and the golf course managers and the HOA uh, managers and municipalities, whoever it may be, we can predetermine what type of slope we are going to try to achieve. So in this case, in this picture, you're seeing a very, very gentle slope, probably a 1718 slope. Uh, and again, that is accomplished by having communication with the property owner and determining what type of uh, final result you want. In this case, it was a it was a uh, a golf course that uh, that had lost their bed, you know, lost their embankments, lost their their uh, uh, lost their shore sides. And in addition to deploying a dread socks in this case, uh, we also consulted with them or or, or our service provider uh, consulted with them about establishing vegetation on the littoral shelf as well as allowing a, a small riparian buffer. And I'm, I hope you can see it in that picture that the combination of stabilizing the shoreside, stabilizing the environment, anchoring that new, newly established, uh, newly established shoreline up to uh, stable earth, and then adding into that the nutrient uptake planning of the, the littoral planting, as well as that riparian buffer, all ends up creating this, this uh, symphony of functional new uh, uh, established and stable environment. So the keys to the success are the planning, the the ultimate final uh, final result, and then obviously being able to deliver to this property owner exactly what they want using the uh, using the SOC system in combination with with other uh, with other functions. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are a lot of different ways that that stability needs to be achieved. In this case, more more so than the aesthetics, although it, although the final product is aesthetically very pleasing, this was a situation where risk and safety and potential liability to an HOA was the motivation behind uh, deploying the system. Uh, you can see in the pictures here that these are homeowners who are at risk not only of losing losing more of their land, but they've lost the ability to use the land and are at risk of having, you know, you know someone walking a dog or a child playing or, uh, you know, for whatever reasons we all use property behind our houses. Uh, this was a situation where there was a liability issue and the, the association determined that it was necessary to reestablish the uh, the edge of the water body and establish it in a way that it was going to be long lasting and 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 effective. Uh, you can see the picture on the left where the property is literally adjacent to that fence line and and almost impossible to work with. Uh, you know the sock system is interesting because it's deployed in an empty uh, in an empty condition and then and then filled with the organics once it's once it's anchored to the shoreline. Um, the the one of the advantages of working with high density polyethylene and the system that that we that we've uh, that we've devised is that the weight of it compared to other systems is 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 is, is, is diametrically opposed right so so think about what the weight of a hundred linear feet of rock would be and in certain environments rock is is a is a is a good choice in this case there was no way to get any type of, of uh, heavy machinery back there. So 100 feet of the system that we deployed uh, weighs uh, under 40 pounds for the 100 feet prior to filling it. 
And then as, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, the, the finished product uh, is, is not only aesthetically pleasing, as we had mentioned before, but a safe, stable, anchored environment. One of the, one of the keys to the success of this and one of the keys uh, to, to, the, to the finished product is that, is that we anchor and we integrate and SOX integrates into the stable environment, which is unique in its, in its design. The, the common problem that we find in parks and in municipal environments and even in, uh, and even in HOAs and, and, and golf courses, as, as we mentioned before, but this is very typical of a, of a park environment where a municipality has created or, de or defined an area where children are supposed to play and people are supposed to walk their dogs. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a park environment where, where when people had moved into the community, they had a certain amount of space that was functional and usable. And the problem we have now is that you've lost the asset, you've lost the land, you've lost the ability to enjoy this public space. In, uh, in this case, what we're able to do is we are able to reestablish where that original shoreline was picking up in this case, uh, I believe it was, this was years ago, but uh, in this case, I believe we picked up about 35 to 40 feet of, of filled area behind the eroded shoreline. And again, the way that the system works is by establishing that new shoreline, but then anchoring to a stable substrate, we transfer that stability from the stable sub substrate to the new shoreline and we're able to create an entirely stable area. We're not just putting things on top of the eroded surface. We are redefining potentially where that new shoreline, that new stable shoreline should be based on history or based on the needs of the client. So, you know, again, we have, we have uh, the, the function of aesthetics. We have the mitigation of liability. Uh, and we have the the continued use or the or the mitigation of that loss of land, being able to create a safe, stable, bioengineered, living, breathing environment that's that's safe for public use. I think we are now going to turn this back over to Bo. And uh, again, I appreciate the fact that you guys had me on and I look forward to the questions and answers afterwards. Bo, you're beautiful. And I'm glad I'm seeing your face and not mine now. <laughs> we appreciate that, Ryan. Um, we're going to look at some other alternatives besides just the socks because uh, you know, not every product fits in every situation. And we, we a lot of people want to know more about using coconut fiber logs. And um, we have used coconut fiber logs in our business for a long time. Um, a lot of people have. Um, I, I think it's real common. And if people, if you think about it, when you're driving down the highway, a lot of times you'll see DOT, Department of Transportation. Uh, they will be doing roadside work. And a lot of times they'll have logs that are sediment barrier logs to prevent the erosion from the areas that they're working in from washing away. And, and a lot of times that's made out of the same type of coconut fibers uh, is, is we're talking about here. Um, basically it's comprised of natural coconut. So it's broken down and, and then woven into this uh, in the, into these logs. Uh, it's been reported that, that they can be stable for two to five years. Um, I think that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, I think it can be stable for two to five years if it's left there and untouched and not not uh, bothered. It, it probably can last that long. Um, these coconut fiber logs are really more of a temporary uh, short-term solution, um, but it also is an economic solution. Um, a lot of times people will put this in here until they come up with a better solution um, and a, a longer term solution. Um, a lot of times it, they, these are used where people need to go ahead and uh, can find a construction site, a construction area to keep that uh, sediment that's disturbed from washing back into somebody's water body. Um, it's good for areas where you have slow or real low water movement. Um, um, 
it's not really that good if you have a lot of high water movement. It, these things can be uh, uh, a continued water flow through these things can tend to push them out and bulge them out. Um, these materials do not have uh, ripstop in it. So if you do get a tear in it or get it damaged in some way, it can t continue to deteriorate from there. So again, I, I think the, the, the coconut logs, the coconut fiber logs are, are a, a good alternative for a short term um, and a temporary fix. Um, they're held in place usually with these uh, stakes that are pounded through them and into the ground. Um, not only are those stakes can be, you know, they could be a hazard. Uh, people could trip and fall and if, uh, you would hate to think that someone can impale themselves on one of these stakes that are sticking up, um, but it is a potential um, and it's not really that sightly either to have those sticking up. And again, <coughs> that's why we say that it really is a more temporary um, so solution and, 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 uh, and short term. <coughs> the um, the the one thing good about these also is that you can actually um, plant plantings behind them. Uh, it does provide a medium for the roots to grow into as well. So a lot of times people will plant or put the uh, coconut logs in there uh, so that they can have a substrate for the aquatic plants to go into. And um, it, it does make for a good opportunity in that sense. Um, one thing I also will uh, let you know is that uh, um, the people have done this and used these in a temporary situation where they had a lot of erosion problem and they were working or trying to save their money to do uh, a larger, more in-depth uh, restoration uh, with erosion control. You can actually take the socks material and uh, these do not necessarily have to be removed. Um, once they're installed, you can actually uh, pull the socks material right up over top of it. Um, so that, that's uh, interesting. We, we've actually had people do that same thing with riprap, uh, big rocks, and uh, rock does provide another alternative as well. Uh, a lot of people don't like the uh, the sightliness of, of, of riprap, and uh, th those along with this coconut log, fiber logs, you can actually pull the material right up over top of it. So um, at this time, uh, I, I think what we're going to do is um, we're going to talking our next slide with vegetation uh, buffers. Um, I think we've already mentioned this before, but uh, it's really uh, it, really important to try to incorporate vegetation buffers where, pos where possible. Uh, there's a lot of benefits from having vegetation buffers. Um, number one, that it does help to stabilize sediment and, and, and keep sediment from washing in. It's almost like a filter trap where, where <clears throat> fine sediments can be held up into the plant beds before it gets into the water body. Um, they're excellent for filtering out nutrients, your phosphorus, your nitrogen, um, things like this uh, help those plants to grow and it's intercepted before it goes into the water body, which basically would just feed your algae. Um, the, the other really benefit of, of having uh, vegetation buffers is, is it, it can really be aesthetically pleasing uh, if done the right way. Um, there's a lot of experts out there that have a lot of years of experience of taking these uh, materials and, um, and, and these plants and, and, and sculpturing in such a way and picking right combinations where some of them flower and some times of the year and other times of the year other ones flower. So it, it can be really aesthetically pleasing and uh, it can really, really help to uh, uh, slow down the erosion of your shoreline. I get asked a lot of times, you know, well, what kind of materials do you want to use in that? And, you know, my response is that you really want to consult with, with, with your, uh, your market development specialist, uh, your, your aquatic biologists that you have working for you, because depending on your situation and where you're at, uh, there are different plants that are suited for different, different situations. Um, but there are some real common plants that people do like to, to use. Pickerel weed uh, is, is a good one. Now, I'll try to avoid some of the scientific terms because it's, that was probably more confusing, but pickerel weed is, is a pontadera that you have duck potato. Uh, it's a, actually a Sagittaria. Um, 
it has a real white flower on it where pickerel weed has a purple flower. It's a real, people probably have seen these things and maybe not known what the name was, but um, they're very attractive plants to grow right around there, uh, around the edge that you can plant. Uh, orchids, uh, lizard tail, uh, sedges, and bulrush. One thing that I will caution you about is to do vegetation buffers correctly, you you can't just establish them and walk away from them. Um, number one, they can be very difficult to establish. Um, I remember working with some groups uh, actually at N uh, North Carolina State University where they were trying to perfect the way that you can establish these plants. And, and they were having a lot of problems in some places because uh, the plants were dying and, and they weren't getting them to grow. And here to come to find out that we were having a lot of uh, animals, uh, uh, turtles and, uh, and and a lot of other uh, ducks, for example, would come in and they'd like to feed on organisms that were getting around the roots and they were pulling them up. Um, and they actually had established cages around them to prevent the turtles and, and ducks from getting into them. And here uh, the plants grew really well. So it, it is a little bit of effort to establish these. You really know, have to know what you're doing. Um, the benefit of using it along with the socks material, for example, is uh, what we mentioned about earlier. That material is a really protective material you can cut into and plant these plants right into it. Um, then it's protected. The roots are protected from those organisms or those animals that could could cause damage while they're trying to establish those plants. The other thing is that you really want to be uh, careful in what plants you pick. You There are some plants that are uh, considered to be aggressive, fast growing plants, and uh, they can be out of hand, grow out of hand very quickly. So if you establish vegetation, buffers, uh, which I hope you do, uh, we all hope you do, uh, we really think that you need to manage them. You can't just plant them and then walk away from them and let them go. Uh, they need to be managed. They, uh, if, if they start to get out of out of uh, abundance, then, then you can have a problem and they can spread more than you really want them to spread into the water. If you manage them, you won't have that problem. Uh, a good example of that are cattails. Uh, there's a lot of, I don't know about controversy or difference of opinions on how well cattails really work in removing uh, nutrients. And um, one thing we do know is if you establish a few little cattails, you can have a lot of cattails pretty quickly. Um, they do spread very quickly from rhizomes. Um, and it's also been reported that those rhizomes, yeah, at times they really do take in a lot of nutrients, but then they also give off a lot of nutrients as well, different times of the year. So, you know, to sum that up, I'd, I'd say we highly recommend using vegetative buffers. I would love to see people use more vegetative buffers in combination with some of the other methods that we mentioned, whether it be the uh, coconut core logs or the, or the socks. Um, it's a perfect fit for the socks material. Um, but, but please consider that you got to manage those uh, plants. You can't just establish them. At this time, I think we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Marty that so she can go ahead and summarize up. I think so. Thanks, Ryan. Um, very, very informative information here. So what is the best solution for you? Um, you know, it all comes down to what your management goal is, um, what's going on at the property, what is your budget? Um, all three things that Bo and Ryan spoke about, um, they're all options um, to relieve your shoreline erosion issues. Um, you know, there's a, a, a solution for every budget, every water body, um, whether it's socks, the coconut logs, or planting a vegetative buffer. Um, you know, we, we think that it's important to not ignore your erosion issues, but look for a solution. Um, thanks again, guys. Really, really appreciate it. So it looks like we had a ton of questions come through. So I wanted to move on to our question and answer session with Bo and Ryan. Um, so this first question we got here is from Lori in Florida. Um, and she's asking, when are erosion control solutions needed? And when can you tell it's time to repair the shoreline? And we are going to see if Ryan can answer that for us. Uh, thanks, Marty, and uh, and and thank you, Lori. That's a that's a great question. And 
so I, I think the question was when 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 do you know that erosion has gotten out of control and when do we need to when do we need to fix it? So That's well, correct. All right, so uh, you know, erosion is prevalent in nature, and 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 I'm not gonna you know I, I'm not gonna say that that it's always uh, absolutely necessary to deal with it. It, it. it you have to deal with it when it becomes uh, when it becomes a a problem, right? So so when you're when you have a loss of an asset or when it when it becomes a a, a liability situation or when it's just so aesthetically displeasing. Um, and, and and it mostly is obviously when we're talking about erosion problems in an area where we as people or animals, uh, uh, where, where, where we as people are going to interact with it and and use the function of that property and 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 you know and, and where we where we have to create and establish and maintain that 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 safe environment. Um, the the potential loss of property. As we mentioned earlier in this in this uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, is is a big problem, and and erosion relates to potential loss of property. So so when we when we have that situation where it's going to be negatively affecting people's lives, uh, and 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 you know and 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 clearly become more dynamic and 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 worsening over time, that's when it needs to be dealt with, specifically when you're talking about erosion in a community or erosion in a water body that where people utilize the area, attacking the most severe eroded environment first is obviously what, 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 what is recommended. I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. And this is from Larry in Florida. And Larry's asking, what are some methods to slow down or prevent erosion before repair is necessary? And Bo, why don't you take that for me? Thanks, Marty. Um, and it's a great question. You know, you have to think about this for a second. And uh, what is the some of the main causes for, from erosion? And basically, it's wind and water, wind and wave action, uh, high flow situations, and uh, heavy storm events. Um, think about some of the hurricanes that we've seen just recently. We, and, you know, that's a lot of water movement and a lot of wind, you know, action. And uh, so heavy winds and heavy rains, uh, heavy water flow uh, can cause a lot of erosion problems. So how do you slow that down? Um, the vegetation buffers. We talked about that, but vegetation buffer is a good way. It helps the, those roots of those veg of that vegetation helps to keep that soil in place, helps to slow it down from being eroded away. Uh, another thing is, I, I would really encourage people, whether it's a lake or a pond or even an HOA stormwater pond, to pay close attention to your outflow and your inflow structures. Uh, keep those maintained. Um, if you can avoid the excessive high flow and, and uh, if your outflow structures are working properly, uh, it's going to have uh, allow that excess water to leave quickly and not spend so much time moving up and eroding away on your shoreline. So I would say really that the two big ways to help prevent it would be to put something in there to whether it's vegetation or, or these other features that we're talking about to, to, to impact and to take up that, that energy that's produced by the wind and waves. Um, think about water skiers, wake borders. They're always throwing up wakes and, and, and pushing that water off to the side. If you have something there that can break that, that wave action up before it hits the shore, I think it can really help prevent, uh, prevent the erosion. Great, thank you so much, Bo. All right, let's move on to this next question from Robert in Florida. And Robert's asking, what permits, if any, are needed from any governmental authority before installing shore or dredge socks? And Ryan, why don't you answer that for us? Uh, sure, thanks, Marty. And uh, and I believe you said the, question, the, the, the person's name was Robert. So thank you, Robert, for asking the question. Um, so as it relates to permits, the the SOX system has been uh, has been has been considered to be permit exempt in most environments. It's considered to be a maintenance product. It's not considered construction, although it is long lasting and uh, uh, and and meant to be 
installed once and left there for a long time. I believe, as Marty had mentioned earlier, there are installations dating back 19 years uh, up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, all the way to California, to Texas, to Florida, overseas, we're in a number of countries as well. Uh, but because the system technically is removable, and 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 it, and it is and it is integrating with the shoreline, but it's not a permanent structure. It's considered to be uh, it's considered to be maintenance. That being said, you should definitely consult with and check with your service provider and installer um, to make sure that that there are no permits necessary. Uh, the, when you're often often when you're working in waterways and you're working with organics and and, uh, and and taking material from a water body out of that water body, it's often falling into different jurisdictions uh, like uh, Army Corps of Engineers or water management districts. So, uh, so I would I would definitely suggest uh, having a clarification discussion with the contractor, with the service provider, provider that's going to be uh, installing the system. Great, thank you, Ryan. All right, moving on. Here's another person in Florida, Valerie. She's asking, can erosion control management be an annual service? And Bo, why don't you take this one? Well, um, it's a great question because uh, I, I, most of you probably know that uh, a large uh, uh, part of what Solitude does is provide annual maintenance and that annual maintenance can consist of a lot of different things everything from maintaining your fountains and aeration uh, to vegetation control managing your buffer zones if you establish them with uh, vegetation but of course why not include uh, the possibility of, of having somebody that knows what to look for uh, pay attention to the shoreline and and make you aware uh, someone is out there looking at that if you have someone coming out uh, monthly, uh, bi-monthly, looking and examining your shoreline all the way around, um, if you can catch things before they become a massive problem, you're much better off. So it could easily be incorporated into an annual maintenance pro type program. Um, another aspect to think about with this is if you have a lot of shoreline and you have a lot of problems with your shoreline, it can be uh, expensive if you're going to do a lot of work all at one time. Um, there are a lot of communities that have uh, talked to us about saying, can we do this in sections? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you know, we can we can come out and do one section one year. Uh, and then the next year we can do another section and the following year another section. Um, so that could be an annual process of adding, continually adding until you get all of your uh, damaged shoreline taken care of. So. Uh, to summarize that up, I would say yes, it's it's a very reasonable uh, thing to consider, uh, and especially in 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 regards to inspections of your shoreline. Great, thank you, Bo. All right, moving on. Madison in Virginia is asking, can socks only be used on freshwater ecosystems? Ryan, why don't you answer this? Uh, thank you, Madison, and thank you, Marty, and thank you, Bo. Uh, no, uh, so so the question can it only be used in freshwater? Uh, Socks is used currently in freshwater, brackish water, salt water, uh, and in and 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 environments where there's no water at all, uh, hillsides and dunes and berms and upland environments. So uh, so the answer is categorically, Socks is applicable wherever there is an erosion problem uh, that needs to be solved. We do a lot of water body uh, solutions and a lot of fresh water body solutions uh, because of the nature of the system being able to accept that vegetation and help filtrate that subsurface runoff and keep nitrates and phosphates out of that adjacent water body. But uh, fresh water, brackish water, salt water, hillsides, your backyard, we, uh, we, it's very likely that we have a solution, but it's a very good question, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. All right. So Tim in Tennessee is asking, what is the average cost of SOX erosion control solutions? Bo, why don't you answer this one? All right. Um, 
Marty, uh, interesting. And Tim, thanks for the question on this one. Um, uh, I, I would really be hesitant to give an average cost because you really have to understand something here. Every shoreline is a little bit different, uh, different methods, uh, different amount of slope, different amount of material that may be needed. Um, I've heard Ryan uh, give us a, a, an example of a, a cost per linear foot before, but I, I've learned over the years to be really, really cautious about giving a expectation um, that could be either good or bad uh, to, to somebody. So my answer to that is, I would really highly encourage you to, to have uh, one of the uh, market development specialists come out. They immediately contact and coordinate with the people from SOX, and they can give you an estimate on that specific to your condition and to your site. Um, my fear is to give an average number uh, would get the excitement of some people only to let get them let down to find out that theirs was a lot worse than what that that average number is or vice versa you know i'd hate to have someone think oh that's a high number i can't afford that and next thing you know uh, once someone came out and looked at it that that cost probably could have been a lot less than what was originally said so i'm not trying to avoid the question um you know i can get uh, people thinking that, but uh, I, I would really encourage you that there are so many variables uh, to look at here that I highly encourage you to contact uh, the right people, your market development specialists, and let them and SOX come up with that estimate cost for your situation. Great. Thank you, Bo. And I thought that was a great answer. <laughs> Um, all right, moving on. Ellen in Maryland is asking, what are the possibilities with dredging as an erosion control solution? Ryan, why don't you take this? Uh, yes, Ellen, that's a, a great question. And, and dredging is a, is a meaningful component of, of one of our systems, which is called the dredge socks. So, so when you're talking about dredging materials out of a water body, and putting them back onto an eroded shoreline, that in itself is a great idea. Uh, what historically has been a problem though, is when you put those dredge spoils back onto an eroding uh, environment, eroding substrate, uh, an eroding shoreline or hillside, is that essentially we're kind of getting into that, doing the same thing over and over again is not going to yield a different result. I don't wanna talk about insanity and silly, but, but you're, by taking materials, out of a water body, putting them on a shoreline or hillside, and then not stabilizing them, or attempting to stabilize them using just vegetative uh, practices. Unfortunately, it's a it, that material in that environment becomes inherently unstable, uh, which is where the sock system comes in. So, so integrating those dredge spoils into the dredge sock system, where those dredge spoils go into, as Bo had mentioned earlier, the taco. Uh, that system holds all that material in place and it anchors it to that upland shoreline and it stabilizes it and then we vegetate it either with seed or sod or uh, uh, appropriate local plantings. But, but being able to contain those dread spoils and then stabilize it further with additional vegetative practices that's where you have a solution that, uh, that, is, that is long lasting. But, but to answer the question, yes, dredging is a good form of erosion control as long as you stabilize it. The other point that I want to make is that by dredging that material out of the adjacent water body, you're effectively allowing that water body to, to regain its healthy depth. And by putting those dredge spoils into our sock system, we filtrate subsurface runoff of nitrate and phosphate. So it, 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 creates a filtrated environment where you don't have that nutrient loading into the water body. So you've got a healthy water body, you've got a stable environment, and you've got a beautifully aesthetic shoreline. But that's a, that's a great question and I appreciate it. Great, thank you, Ryan. Okay, Terry in Virginia, she's asking, or he, um, do rocks, riprap, and trees serve as a good solution to erosion? Bo, why don't you answer this? Uh, great question. Uh, Riprap, uh, rocks, uh, landscape timbers. 
uh, bulkheads uh, have all been used for years uh, to help try to, to to provide you know erosion control and uh, stop the shoreline from eroding away. I would I would venture away from trees. Uh, the simple fact about trees, um, even though trees are are beautiful to have uh, you know near your water body, but uh, if you're if you're looking at a a, a bank, uh, the root system of those trees. Uh, can actually weaken the stability of the uh, of that bank. Uh, a good example of that is 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 highly regulated stormwater retention ponds. Um, you can actually be fined for having uh, trees growing on the uh, the dam, the spillway. Um, so that that's probably a, a, a worst case example is the spillway or the dam. Um, but I, I think it's actually I like to say that's probably true for. Uh, uh, a lot of shorelines. Now, if you have uh, don't have a large slope, uh, you can see in the picture there that we have trees growing, um, it, and it does provide for a, a good backdrop to to that pond. So trees can actually add some beauty. But in regards to stabilization, I think that uh, the rocks, the riprap, the bulkheads are are uh, are ways that people have done it. I guess it's uh, up to the individual on whether or not they like the look of 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 having riprap or stone or rock uh, there. Some people really do. Um, some people want that more natural look, and uh, that's why I went back to. Uh, I'll go back to saying what I mentioned earlier. We have had several opportunities where people wanted to change the look of what where they had the riprap. They didn't want to remove the riprap, and they were able to pro provide the socks material right over top of that. The same thing with landscape timbers, the bulkheads. Uh, we've had people that actually went ahead and folded that unit, slid that taco uh, right up on top of the bulkheads and, and then put some backfill or dredge material right in over top of that and was able to sod right on top of that uh, within before the job was ever even finished. So those are all uh, suitable ways of, uh, of, of, of providing erosion control. And, and I think it just depends, again, to go back to saying uh, what fits your situation and uh, what fits your, your situation best. Great, thank you, Bo. All right, so Karen in New York is asking, what are some effective ways to restore shoreline stone retaining walls that are durable yet natural and with a minimum impact to the lake's ecosystem? Ryan, why don't you answer this one? Sure, Marty, thank you very much. Um, so, so the question I believe came out of New York, where we see a lot of stone walls, and and it makes sense that 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 she asked it. Uh, this question kind of ties into the question that was last asked of Bo, which is how does rock and stone um, and, and some of the some of the more uh, uh, historically acceptable products that are becoming less functional, less less acceptable these days? How does it? How do we incorporate those things with? a with a current plan right so so the SOC system uh, has the ability to work with hard armored systems as well but the problem the, the the core of the problem is stability right so none of the systems or most of those other systems don't integrate into the shoreline they sit on top of or adjacent to and and they have certain function but but remember, Mother Nature is going to break the, the link in the chain that is least strong. So often the least strong link in the chain is the soil and substrate. So rock is very strong and riprap can be very strong, but it still sits on top of an area that, that, that has some instability. So with that in mind, what we can do is we can incorporate a bioengineered living environment and we can we can tie that in aesthetically with stone and stone walls and riprap if that's part of the look and feel of the community. So that's one thing. So if, so if part of what defines you as a golf course or as an HOA or as as just your general community, if you're defined as stone gate, you want to have some stone. So we can create living bioengineered shorelines that are very stable and very, very beautiful, and we can incorporate some stone. The other thing is that the SOC system will stabilize the environment behind or adjacent to 
that stone so the stone will be able to stay in place over a long period of time. So, so again, I hope that answers the question. I think the question was related to uh, how can we keep stone but keep it stable and, and, and working with stone is something that we do all the time. I hope that answers the question and, uh, and uh, I hope you're not freezing up there in New York because it's beautiful here in Florida. Thanks, Ryan, appreciate it. Um, really quick, I just wanted to remind everybody um, that we are gonna have a survey at the end of the webinar um, and then you also have an option in there to request a consultation um, if need be and um, I wanted to let you guys know we received a ton of questions and um, we're obviously not going to be able to get to all of them but we will send an email out with answers to those questions and we're hoping to get that out next week and um, we do have time for a couple more live questions so let me move on here um, and this is from Robert in New York. He is asking, what are some ways you can protect your shoreline from rodents and other wildlife? It's a great question. Bo, why don't you answer this? Well, hey, good question again. Um, you know, there, there's, I've, I've seen a lot of different things that people have tried to do uh, to, to protect the shoreline, everything from putting wire mesh down, uh, putting more riprap down. Um, we, we've seen it all. And, uh, you know, I, I know uh, a lot of people will resort to trapping and moving uh, the rodents from one place to another, uh, move the problem from one pond to another pond. Uh, we have seen that. Uh, so I don't know if there's actually a really, really good answer to that. Um, we do know that uh, we have situations where we actually have installed socks before where that material, that woven knitted material uh, is, is very, very difficult for them to chew through and they basically will avoid it. So uh, where we have had uh, muskrat holes and, and, and uh, beaver slides in the past, where we've actually in, incorporated uh, and reestablished shoreline and with the socks material, we haven't seen that problem uh, come back. So they are they, you know, it is a type of material that resists the the, in, the rodents from getting into it. Um, but again, I, I, I've seen other methods. I don't know if if I can say um, uh, if, if there's a a one way that's better than another. Um, you know they're they're part of the ecosystem. They're going to be there. They're going to they're going to live there too. And um, um, sometimes we have to accept a little bit of that. Um, if it gets to be uh, a, a point where they're causing economic damage or uh, ecological damage to the pond and create uh, places where you get water leaving the pond because of breaches in the in in the dike or the shoreline, um, then then you can look at doing some of these other methods we talked about. Um, but at the same time, um, good luck with that. Uh, it, it, that's probably a, a problem we hear a lot about, and uh, I wish we had a better answer for you than that. Great. Thank you, Bo. Um, we've got time for just a few more questions, so let me get right to it. Um, Rindy in Connecticut is asking, we have some islands where trees have fallen that once held back the hillside soil. What can we do to rehabil rehabilitate those banks? Ryan, why don't you answer this? Sure, thanks, Marty. Um, so, so it sounds to me like we're talking about dunes or upland uh, uh, components of an island, and and what we do is 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 our service providers will go out and they'll look at the environment and they'll determine what types of array or layout or design they're going to use with the SOC system. Uh, what's interesting about SOCs is 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 as you saw in the in the previous uh, slides, it's an open system. It's very flexible. We have six foot, 12 foot, 18 foot, 24 foot. We can essentially create uh, uh, the ability to cover large areas or create large areas or restore large areas or small areas. Um, so what we would do is we would assess where the previous line laid. We would then determine what the, the the vegetation plan is and what the what the continuation plan is right so so we might reestablish an entire berm or reestablish a portion of the island where the where the trees were um, and 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 re and rehabilitate those banks uh, by using the containment of the sock system but also using those vegetative practices 
Additionally, if there are trees that are at risk of being, that are partially undermined, and, and typically an arborist would say that tree's not gonna make it, we're gonna have to remove it, um, that, that is inconsistent with what we found. We have been able to restore a significant amount of earth adjacent to the exposed root ball and give that tree stability back and allow that existing tree to, to maintain its position in the berm, in the island, in the environment. Uh, but again, by, by defining the, 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 the goal of the new edge lines and berm lines and hillsides and shorelines, and then, and then determining the, the, the vegetative practices. And again, our system, we cut directly into the system because it is knitted and not woven, right? A weave is a single piece of fabric that goes back and forth, back and forth. Uh, a, a woven, uh, the woven material has only a couple of inches of, of, of length of string in it. So the, the fact that we're knitted allows us to cut into the system and plant uh, more than just plugs. We can plant trees and, and, and speed the establishment of that uh, ecological environment. But yes, reestablishing dunes uh, does more than just make the beach look beautiful. It actually reestablishes that ecosystem where, where, where it creates balance of, of water flow and and uh, vegetative growth and animal species and habitation. So, so again, these are these are all links in a chain. We want to keep the entire chain very, very strong. But that's that's a great question about about berms and banks and islands. Thank you very much. All right, guys, we have one more question, um, and we are going to send this out to Bo. And Carolyn in Massachusetts is asking, do you have any tips on how to present shoreline management to people who don't like others telling them what to do with their property? Well, this is a tough question, uh, but I think it's a very appropriate question. Uh, you know, a lot of these questions I've been able to, you know, answer pretty quickly right off the top of my head. But, you know, this one I got to stop and scratch my head a little bit uh, and, and, and really put some thought to it. And, um, I, 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 I think the first thing that comes to my mind is that, that uh, uh, you're, you're, you're really lucky if you get somebody or an organization or landowners that all agree on the same thing. So it's not unusual to have people uh, disagree with what they want or the way things look. Um, but there is one common denominator that I think that maybe we can pull all this together, and, and, and that's simply... Uh, it's hard to argue with somebody that wants the best water quality. Um, you know, what's best for the water? What, you know, how do we how do we limit the nutrient load into the water body? Mm -hmm. And if you tie the um, the the shoreline management and uh, into water quality, uh, it might be a really good way to uh, to to get everybody to buy in. It's it's hard to argue against wanting good water quality. Uh, we mentioned to you that uh, uh, vegetation buffers, for example, or even the socks material, for example, the coconut logs are, are good examples of, of helping to reduce that nutrient input into the water. So whether or not you like the aesthetically look of, of whatever erosion control method you're doing or shoreline stabilization, if you tie that into water quality and really promote the fact that you're doing this also to help water quality, uh, that that might be a really good way to, to, to win everybody over. Um, I really appreciate this time. It's been fun to talk about it. Um, I'm glad we got a lot of experts to surround ourselves with as well. So, uh, We'll turn it back over to Marty to close, but we appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, Bo. Thank you so much, Ryan. Those are really great answers to some great questions. And like I mentioned, you know, too many questions to even get through, but we will get those answered and sent out to you guys. One more last reminder about the feedback survey. Um, we would really appreciate you guys filling that out and letting us know um, what you thought about the webinar. And also remember that one lucky person is going to win a $50 Amazon gift card and a solitude cooler. Again, thank you very much. Have a great Valentine's Day, like the guy said, and we'll see you next time.